Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. London, an alcoholic suicide at age 40, wrote to his friend Jack Barrymore, and he said, Jack, last night the creature came. And he took my heart away. This is a disease of the spirit and of the soul. And if we don't take care of ourselves and our spirits and our souls here, we will be in big trouble. And that's the whole point of this primary purpose. And that's the whole point of the announcements they make about singleness of purpose. It isn't that we're trying to exclude anybody. Our book says we are never to be exclusive. We are to be all inclusive. But it's all inclusive with respect to alcoholics. Now I know I'm preaching to the choir here. But I think you should know these things if you have to deal with these people who insist on trying to use our own traditions against us. When someone tells you that all I need is a, is a desire to stop drinking. No, no, no. No, no. You need to be an alcoholic. And that is someone who is powerless over alcohol. And you can have all the desires you want. And you won't be able to stop drinking. Because the one thing about alcoholics is they can't stop drinking. Correct? You could do anything else, you'd probably fly to the moon. But you had absolutely nothing to face that booze with. And somebody said, you know, Somebody said to me recently, what was your favorite kind of booze? I said, more. <laughs> I said, why? I said, more. I said, what, what, what will you have to drink? More. Just, you know, give it. Anyhow, the message is this message. The message of Young to Roland Hazard. Find a spiritual experience. The message of Socorro to Bill Wilson. Don't tell him. Tell them are going to die. Try to get them to pay their attention. Their soul, their spirit is in jeopardy. This is the message of alcoholics. And we're not a religion. In fact, God, we're not saints. We are not saints. And God, for that, I'd be out of here very soon. What will we do with a saint if he showed up here? Where you want, where is he going to put him? <laughs> Don't put him next to me. Hello. What's your name? I'm Frank. I'm from Mississippi. Get out of here. <laughs> Make me feel bad just looking at you. <laughs> Jesus. When somebody walks in and says, I'm Charlie and I'm an alcoholic, I know a great deal about him. Right then and there, he's a rotten, dirty, no good, lying, cheating son of a bitch <laughs> who stole money from his parents, his brothers, his sisters, his neighbors. He's no goddamn good. My kind of a guy. <laughs> And that's what the step says. Now, in 1950, this is to show you this is not a new problem we're dealing with. This is not a new problem. It's not very little things are new. Here we go. 1958. I've been an alcoholic. I've been through. I was here. I was here when Jesus came by <laughs> in the 60s. He came by. People were coming to me bringing Bibles. I wanted to rap about Jesus. I was here when the hyperglycemic epidemic struck. <laughs> Everybody was hyperglycemic. They're all walking around having sugar, glucose tolerance tests, you know, they're eating little, little meals. <laughs> the ladies liked it, they all lost weight, you know, they're running around eating trail mix or something, you know. <laughs> God. And then the victims all showed up, the 80s, and the victims all came in, all, they're all from dysfunctional families, you know. <laughs> Does anybody know what a functional family is? They're often dysfunctional. They were probably the cause of the dysfunction in their family. I just found out about four years ago that I'm from a dysfunctional family. I didn't know that. I didn't know that at all. I had no father and an alcoholic mother. They were very dysfunctional. Well, we had breakfast at 7 and dinner at 6. Worked all right for me. So anyhow, and I'm digressing. In 1958, Bill Wilson, Bill Wilson in 1958 wrote an article for the grapevine because the non-alcoholics were beginning to show up in great numbers. I was here 
when the pills began to come through. You know, you have to understand that prior to the 1960s, there was no such thing as psychotropic medicine. Before the 1960s, there was no value. There was no Librium. There was no anything. There was uh, phenobarbital, you know, sedation, stuff like that. But all of those those other uh, pharmaceuticals, the psychotropic pharmaceuticals, were not there. They just didn't exist. And all of a sudden, they came. And I remember uh, Milltown was the first one. And uh, I got a bottle of that. I was, you know, I'm drunk all the time in the 60s, and uh, I'm really reaching my peak. I'm around the 63. I'm really at the top of my form. That was the first time I came to AA, and, and my wife, she who must be obeyed, uh, made me go to this doctor, and he gave me a, a bottle of Milltown. And he said, when you feel like drinking, have one of these. Well, I felt like drinking day and night, so I was having a lot of Milltown. And I felt pretty good. And I, I felt so good that I walked into a saloon and uh, I said to this jerk who I used to know you know, drink with, look at that, I got that stuff, Milltown. He said, yeah, throw it right in the middle of a martini. He said, we call it a Miltini. <laughs> it will knock you on your ass. I said, it will? He said, yeah, boom, boom. <laughs> and it did, and it did. And that was the end of my involvement with psychotropic drugs. <laughs> so anyhow, here's Bill now, and, and you know, and here's the 60s, and the, the values are still enough, and they taught like this. You know, the mouth is very dry, and they say, they say, what the hell is the matter with Nothing's the matter with me. <laughs> well, you can't, can't smell anything, you know, but he's acting like a fool. He's falling asleep in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, that kind of stuff. And he said, well, you take it, says, just let the doctor describe it, so. Say, where is he? He's got it in every pocket. He's got his hat. You know, oh, Jesus. And the question is, what do you do with these people? There's no, there's no difference. There's no difference in principle between Valium users, cocaine users, heroin users, gay overeating cross dressers. <laughs> What's the difference? Tell me the difference. Here's Bill. Now, we wouldn't characterize Bill as a, a hard ass, would we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> says, sobriety, freedom from alcohol through the teaching and practice of the 12 steps is the sole purpose of an AA group. Groups have repeatedly tried other activities and they have always failed. It has also been learned that there is no possible way to make non-alcoholics into AA members. See? Now, in case you had trouble with that, <laughs> absorbing that we printed that we printed this which is this light <laughs> and in this we repeat and we put it in color I see no way of making non-alcoholics into AA members experience says we can admit no exceptions even though drug users and alcoholics happen to be cousins of a sort. If we persist in trying this, we'll be hard on the drug user himself. He's in the wrong place. You understand? He's in the wrong place. As well as on AA, we must accept the fact that no non-alcoholic, whatever his affliction, can be converted into an alcoholic and an AA member. You understand? Now, that's not being hard-ass. That's the the core of this fellowship. Non-alcoholics do not belong in AA. That's that. Now, they have these questions. Can a non-alcoholic pill or drug addict become an AA member? No. Can such a person be brought as a visitor to an open AA meeting for help and inspiration? Of course, of course, of course. If so, should these non-alcoholic pill or drug users be led to believe they have become AA members? Can a pill or drug taker who has a genuine alcoholic history become a member of AA? That's the Anders. That's the Anders. They're alcoholics. They have an ego problem, like a lot of alcoholics do. Here's the way this one goes. You're an alcoholic? Yeah, well... I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. 
I raised you one. What do you... What do you think of that, you poor rummy? You know, and then, or they may have a couple. Gay, I'm a gay, overeating, cross-dressing, alcoholic, drug addict. My God, you know. Bottles of mine. This is the ego problem. They want, first of all, in violation of everything we hold dear, they want to be different. You understand? The whole core of, of you and I being together is that we are the same. Correct? We are we. Correct? We are we. Without we being we, we don't have the first step, we don't have anything. We are we. They are not we. They want to be recognized as somebody different, who have suffered in some peculiar way that poor rummy me could never possibly understand. You're an alcoholic, you poor thing. Well, listen to this. I'm also, and then they list out what they, who gives a shit? <laughs> and besides, they're saying the same thing twice, are they not? See, the treatment centers uh, are really the villains in this piece. And uh, is that right, keep talking? And I don't like to beat on the treatment centers because they're practically out of business. Practically. I mean, some of them have got such deep pockets that they'll, they'll last for another ten years, but the rinky-dink ones are gone, and the big ones are still hanging around, you know. But uh, in the treatment centers, uh, they, they promote the big lie in this area, the big lie. And it's a matter of principle. Here's the big lie. The big lie is this. One addiction is the same as another. That is a big lie. That is not the same medically. It is not the same chemically. And it certainly is not the same in recovery. You go out to that street over there and go to the supermarket and bring me back a hundred people. Any hundred put them in this room, give me an unlimited supply of cocaine, put it right over there, come back in a month, I will give you 100 cocaine addicts. Every one of them will do anything I ask them to do to get their hands on this stuff. You understand? Go get me another 100. Bring them over here. Give me an unlimited supply of whiskey. Pile it up over there. Come back in a month. I might have 12 alcoholics for you. Eight, 12, something like that. Because alcohol does not cause alcoholism. Cocaine causes cocaine addiction. You understand? It's a physical addiction. Alcoholism starts with a physical addiction, but it's nothing like a physical addiction. If alcoholism was just a physical addiction, we'd have one step. You and I, correct? Come to the meeting. What should I do? Stop drinking, moron. <laughs> oh, is that it? Yeah, see up there, step one, the big step, don't drink. You're here again? This is your second week here. You see that big first step? Don't drink some more. Eh? Don't drink. That would be the thing. But it's not, alcohol is, is, alcoholism is not caused by alcohol. Alcoholism is caused by a separation from God. When this happened to me, I don't know. I know it happened, but I, I can't tell you when, I suppose. I'm not even quite sure I was ever connected. I'm not religious. Then. I was not religious then. I'm not religious now. I've never been religious. But I have a, uh, and my name is O'Keefe. I have a, a Catholic education. I'm a graduate of a Jesuit university. I've never been religious. It never interested. It just never got my attention. It didn't bother me. I'm very, very smart. It just didn't interest me. I thought, that's nice, you know. I was interested in basic things, trying to get laid, and get a job, stuff like that, and find some money so I could get laid. <laughs> and then I got to be a roué alcoholic, and I became sort of a man of the world, you know. I went in 5,000 bars. I got laid twice. You know? uh, but I digress. You see, this, this, uh, let me tell you about Dr. Jelinek. Let me tell you about Dr. Jelinek. Dr. Jelinek, 
back in the 30s and 40s, Dr. Jelinek ran the Yale University School of Alcoholism Studies. See, we've been looking at this thing for a long time. It's now at Rutgers University. They moved it. But Jelinek, and, uh, Jelinek ran this thing. It was connected with Yale. It was part of Yale, quite a place. And he developed, uh, you see, the Jelinek curve about tolerance going up like that and a jump that falls off like you fall off a cliff. That's the Jelinek curve. And in some circles, alcoholism was called Jelinek's disease. So the great Jelinek, scientist that he was, said to a couple of his assistants one day, these people are so baffling. They do such wild things. You know, our book says not only are we insane, but we are strangely insane. And uh, this guy, Jelinek, was confirming all of that. You know, it's, it, our book says the problem centers in the mind. Wouldn't you think a book says the, the problem centers in the alcohol? The problem centers in the fact these people drink impossible amounts of alcohol? The problem centers in the mind. And Jelinek says, the only way I can figure this one out is I'm going to become an alcoholic. He's a real scientist. He says, I will become an alcoholic. And then I'll understand. So he said, bring out some booze. So they went and they got him some booze. He got through about a half a bottle of bourbon. And he was sitting in a chair, and he fell out of the chair. And he hit his head on the corner of the desk as he went out. And he hit the floor and cracked in his pants and passed out. And three hours later, he came to. You know, the first thing he said was, I will never, ever drink anything like that again as long as I live. Now, that's not us. <laughs> You're there at 7 in the morning banging on the door of that bar. Open up this dump. You got anything left? You know that stuff that took away my driving license, my license to be a lawyer, my marriage license, my house, my money, my family, my children, my self-respect, my esteem, my spirit? You got anything left? Give it to me. What's the price? Here. What do you want? Here's my house. Here's my car. Here's my children. Give me that shit. Is that the same shit that knocked you out of the chair, hit you in the head? And I, I love that crap. Give me more. Did you ever say, I'll never drink that again as long as I live? That stuff is crap. That makes you crazy. <laughs> sure it does. That's why we drink it. That's what Sirkoy said. He said, people don't, alcoholics don't drink because it tastes good. If it tastes good, go have an ice cream soda for Christ's sake and leave me alone. Said men and women drink essentially for the effect it has on them. I have a brother-in-law, Louis. Louis is a lawyer, the graduate of the Harvard Law School. You say to Louis, "Would you like another drink, Louis?" You know what he says? No, thank you. I'm beginning to feel it. <laughs> you want to get him right by the neck and say, "That's what it's for, Louis. That's why we drink it, because we feel it." You dumb bastard. And he's just beginning to feel, no, no, no. <laughs> Harvard Law School, they don't want to lose control of the world. You know? Now, all of this has to do with what we're doing here. What is our message and for whom is our message? And it isn't that, uh, again, we're not, I'm not trying to exclude anybody. If someone tells me they have a, a serious heroin problem, I have great empathy for that. I really do. I, I do a great deal of work with uh, lawyers throughout the country. And, uh, as a matter of fact, I am the number one drunken lawyer in the United States of America. This, I am chairman of the board of the lawyers in AA, international lawyers in AA. And we have lots, especially where I live in Miami, lawyers with cocaine problems. And I have great empathy for that. And I try, you know, to find somebody they can work, talk to. Ralph and I were talking about it lunch. I get them somebody who, who's had a cocaine problem. I'm not going to talk to them about their cocaine problem. I never had any cocaine in my life. Not that I, I wouldn't have. Nobody gave me any. That's all. <laughs> it wasn't available. I would have, I would I could become addicted to raisins, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and so I'm not, I'm not putting this that Alcoholics Anonymous is for alcoholics. And it is no good that they try to use our, our uh, traditions against us. And I'll tell you something else. AA is like a great 
self-cleaning oven. And every few years or so, it clicks on to clean. And it burns out all the crap. And these people disappear. I tell you, know why they disappear? Because they're not stupid. You just think I get enough experience. They don't stay very long. Oh, they make a lot of noise in my experience. Well, they, they don't stay a long time. Because it's not for them. They don't need a spiritual awakening. I'm not putting them down. They don't need a spiritual awakening. They need to stop using the drug they're using. That's what they need. If an alcoholic stops using alcohol, you know what happens? He kills himself. You understand me? An alcoholic who stops using alcohol and doesn't have a sufficient substitute kills himself. Meninger, probably the America's greatest psychiatrist, Meninger, the seminal work on psychiatry, has the alcoholic in his chapter on suicide. And he says of us, and Sokwe says it in a different way, manager says of us, of alcoholics, the alcohol is the glue that holds them together. And you take out that alcohol, these people fall apart. They blow up in a thousand. There's a great doctor in Louisville, I know you've ever heard of him. A great, he's a great A man, a great doctor, good speaker, and a very, very smart guy. And I was asking him, I'm always trying to find out about this stuff, and I was asking him about it. And listen to what he said, this is terrific. And this is a physician. He says, alcoholics are born not feeling good. They don't, they're not sick, they don't have to be put anywhere. They don't need any medicine. They just don't feel good. It's a hassle. It's a hassle. They're in the wrong bunch of the wrong family, their brother gets all the good stuff, and they get crap for Christmas, and nobody likes them, and schools are paying the ass, and uh, people are yelling at them all the time, and they don't feel good. They just don't feel good. This sounds like it's familiar to you. And then when they're about 13, maybe 12, 13, somebody says, here, try some of this. So they try it. And they go, ooh. <laughs> and then they say, uh, I'll have another one of those. And they drink that and they go, oh, hmm. Then they have another one. And they say, well, my mother's not so bad. Uh, I feel all right. That school is okay. I'll go there tomorrow. And, uh, look, I'm getting taller. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know how to go over and talk to that girl over there. She's a wait for me to go over and talk to her. Hi, kid, you know. And, and he thinks to himself, Jesus, I feel good. Now, isn't that sort of a euphemism for being drunk? He's feeling good. Correct? I think there's a lot to that. A lot to that explanation. We don't feel good. We just don't feel good. And it's the alcohol that lets us feel good. And so it says we drink for the effect of it, and there's an effect that's illusory. It's out there somewhere. And you all remember, you all remember when you learned to drink, and that wonderful feeling good, you know, and... When you, you learned, you had to learn. You had to stop that bed from, you had to put your foot on the floor. You learned to stop the bed from going like that. Yeah? And you drank your way through it. You learned how to puke like it was an art form. <laughs> and then you got through that phase of it. And pretty soon you had this astounding tolerance. And you're driving all your friends home and all that stuff. And you feel good. Okay? The trouble is we're dealing with a narcotic substance. And so the more you take the less you get, and pretty soon you're taking them the three chords to try to capture that first can of beer, and you're not catching up to it. You're not catching up to it, and it's killing you. But you see, if you take the alcohol out of the alcoholic, without, as our book says, do you have a sufficient substitute? That's what the book says. And it's a very simple proposition. 
Well, then I know I'm preaching to the choir. I need to hear this as much as you do, I think. Here's what our book says. And our book says what I think is all I need to know is what our book says. It says God is or he isn't. What is your answer to be? Now, religion says God is, and he's a 34-year-old Jewish gentleman who died, unfortunately, on a Friday, but he came back on Sunday, and everything's fine ever since. And that's what your idea is. We don't say that. We said he is or he isn't. What is your answer to be? What is your answer to be? Huh? Now, you want to you wanna be right or you want to be sober? You want to be smart like me and bright like me or you want to be sober? You want to show off or you want to be sober? So that's why I had that sponsor. He was terrible to me. He would say that to me. You want to, you want to be smart or you want to be sober, okay? Oh, you're very bright. You're very clever. Now do you want to be sober? I say, I don't feel so good. He say, this may be as good as you'll ever feel. <laughs> I said, Jesus, I'm nervous. What do you think I should do? He said, hold on. I said, well, how do you hold on? He said, let go. <laughs> and then I would whine. You know, I was no different than anybody else. I would whine. Oh, as I was as I whine. I said, when will I get a good job? I had lost a wonderful job. I was a university professor. I lost that job. So when will I get a good job? He said, yeah, when you're ready. Oh, Jesus. I said, well, how do I know I'm ready? He said, you don't have a good job. <laughs> so I thought I, I thought I explained that to you. And that's why we have a sponsor. That's why we have a sponsor. The edition now, this is the, Sammy, this is the second edition, is it? Mark, second, third? Good. Then in the third edition, so it looks like a first edition. In the third edition, when they talk about the forward to the third edition, it's on XXIII. Tempe humor there, Roman numeral. <laughs> How's about this? Recovery begins when insurance runs out. <laughs> Here's what it says in the preface to the third edition of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Each day, somewhere in the world, recovery begins. It begins. It doesn't seem ever to end. Recovery begins when one alcoholic talks with another, sharing experience, strength, and hope. Correct? It is the experience that brings us the strength. My experience as an alcoholic brings me the strength. It is the strength that brings us the hope. It's the experience and the strength and the hope. And hope is where it begins. See, hope is the younger sister of faith. Faith is belief. Faith is, is what religious people have. They believe. And sometimes, and most times, they believe things that are almost unbelievable. You know, you think of Christmas and Easter and all this stuff. Unbelievable stuff. They believe it. They believe it. And uh, hope is less than that. But here we have a faith, I have a faith at least, based on my experience. And you would have a faith based on your experience. No one knows better than you, do they? What brought you here? Is there anybody in the world who knows better than you why you're here? You know. And we can cover it over. Our book says we do that. We, it says deep down, deep down in every man, woman, and child, it says there is a basic idea of God. Oh, it says we covered it over. I did. We covered it over with pomp. Big old, big old kid. Or calamity. The young child dies. 
but deep down it's there, it says. We found it deep down in ourselves, it says. And the book goes on to say that it says things in such a wonderful, unstated, understated way. It says, it was so with us. It was so with them. Now God is or he isn't. And he's in you or he isn't. And he's in me or he isn't. And because he is, we are. And that's how simple it is. Oh, you can argue with it all you want. You can debate it from now till the sun comes home. We never seem to tire of talking, do we? At least I don't. But the truth is basically the truth. And it says in our book, the great fact is this. We have all had vital spiritual experiences. That's the great fact for us. We've had vital spiritual experiences. Not that we stopped drinking. Listen, over the course of years, over the course of history, everywhere and every civilization and every time somebody has stopped drinking. We all know people who, who used to drink and don't drink and they don't go to hey, stop. And they're alcoholics too, some of them. They just put it down. That's the way they are. Our book has the one guy who did it for 25 years and then he retired and boom, he was back at it and back and so. You see, the reason we have June 10th as our birthday is that's the day that Dr. Bob stopped drinking. Now, up to that time, up to June 10th, 1935, there had always been somebody in the world who didn't drink. That's been going on for a long time. But on June 10th, 1935, there were two. And the second one was there because the first one shared his experience, strength, and hope with him. And that's why that's our birthday, because there were two, not one. The we had arrived. And my obligation, and I submit to you, your obligation, as members of Alcoholics Anonymous, is to preserve that we. We alcoholics. To preserve it. In your groups. And I have a suggestion on how you do that. I belong, and I tell you my experience, I belong to a group and I belong to, uh, up to 1984, I lived in New York and I was in one group for 20 years or 19 years and then I've been in the same group since I moved to Florida in 84, which is another 13 years. And the group I belong to in New York and the group I belong to in Florida is all the same. We have two meetings a week. We have a big book meeting on Monday, and we have the step meeting on Thursday. On Monday, we read the big book for 15 minutes, and we go around the room. On Thursday, we have the guy lead the step meeting, and we go around the room. We do not have any discussion on coping the inner child, the outer child, the half in and half outer child. <laughs> We don't discuss resentments, anger. We have no topic meeting. We do not allow reminiscence of drunken escapades. We say this is a big book meeting. Read along with the reader can find your comments to the material read. We say this is a step meeting. Listen to the leader. Can find your materials to the materials discussed by the leader. Now, plenty of non-alcoholics come to my group. We're a very popular group down there. We're a big group. We have maybe 75 members. That's a big group. And the non-alcoholics come and they don't stay. Now, we don't have to throw them out. They get bored. So I'd like to tell you what happened to me today. Ah, take that out into the parking lot. That's what we tell them. That's a parking lot subject. <laughs> Say what? Out in the parking lot. Somebody might listen to you. In here, we don't give a shit. Whether you had a good day or a bad day or some other day, you know. What we want to know is, did you write an inventory? Did you discuss it with your sponsors? Did you admit it to God? Did you admit it to yourself? What happened to you after you did that? We'll listen to that. You understand? Now, these people are not dumb. They know that. This is not for them. They want to go where they can talk about, you know, how they scored and how they did this and how they did that. Which is what I would have loved to have done. 
but I had that sponsor. See? And the reason that we need very, very strong sponsors is because of this breakdown in the hospital. This breakdown in the treatment centers is going to require you and I to be real sponsors. You know, throwing somebody in a car and taking him over to Happy Dale and parking him for a month, that's not 12-step work. A taxi cab do that better than you could do it. Recovery begins when one alcoholic sits down with another alcoholic and shares his experience, his strength, and his hope. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed since Bill went into that uh, Henrietta study and talked to Bob. Now, the span has exchanged, the personnel have, have changed, the breadth, the numbers are incredible. Yeah. It says in the first edition, you know, you may, meet, you may meet some of us as you go around and all that stuff. God, you can't go anywhere now. Without running down hogs, and I was like, "Have it in, uh, you know, if you go to the international convention, you remember that? And I remember in Seattle when the the Russian flag came in and Czechoslovakia and all the Slovak nations came in, and they all came in, and up to the one before that, which was in I forget, uh, Denver, maybe they weren't there. And now it says 190 Montreal, 194 countries. Is that where it is?" I think we're up to three million members, but they're very conservative in how they estimate. And we have to be very careful because Alan is in Virginia Beach. <laughs> and if we make any misstatements, it'll get reported into headquarters. <laughs> now, I brought this thing along, and it's over there. And it's a letter. A guy named Jack up in New York wrote me and asked me what I, I uh, thought we could do about it. And I'm looking here to see if there's anything I left out from what I've been talking about for the last hour and a half. Uh, I talk about the people who come now, I call them grateful, recovering, cross-addicted, chemically dependent, substance abusing, alcoholics and addicts. Uh, that's about right. And I'm not here to knock them or anything else, but there is something spiritual, I suppose which limits the effectiveness of Alcoholics Anonymous to Alcoholics. And about that, there should be no argument or even discussion. Why this is so, I haven't the slightest idea. Why it should not work for other people, I don't know. I know that it does not work in the same way it works for me. I know people who come to my group who are uh, addicted to other drugs, some of them stop using other drugs, and some for a long period of time, too. And their lives are much better. But they do not get what I claim to, to have gotten. And that is not to, I haven't gotten any taller since I came around. I certainly haven't gotten any thinner since I came around here. But what has happened to me is I have enjoyed a spiritual awakening. I have uh, had my my spirit come awake. It wasn't ever that I was so evil. I thought I was something of, of a roué and a man of the world and all the rest of it, but uh, the truth of the matter, I was just another alcoholic, pathetic, powerless alcoholic who had lost the manageability of my life. I couldn't manage my life. It was too much for me. Without help, it was just too much for me. And I, I say, and I, I say, it literally through the grace of God, I was able to enjoy this awakening of my spirit. And I know that sometimes it's difficult to carry this message, and this is the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the message the 12 says, says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result, that's the only result. I didn't get any taller, I didn't get any thinner, I didn't. That's it. We carry this message. The message is the message of the spiritual awakening. The message. To alcoholics, it says. Why would you carry this message to someone who's not an alcoholic? 
What are they going to do with it? They're not going to have the spiritual awakening. They don't need it. They need to stop using the drug they're using. And if they stop using the drug they're using, they will not use it again. Alcoholics, if you put down that booze precipitously, you'll probably kill yourself. You'll jump out of a window. Because your problem never was the stuff in that bottle. Your problem is, our book says we have to concede. We have to learn to concede. It isn't something we know. We have to learn to concede to our innermost self. You understand? This marvelous form that I present to you, this is my outermost self here. This is not my innermost self. This in here, in there, is my innermost self. The problem that says senses in the mind. The mind is not the brain. The brain is an organ. It sits up here on top of your head. It's like a little cap, like a little gelatin cap. It sits up here in the tongue, up here, it goes all the way back there. And it's got a split in the middle of it. It's got a left hemisphere, it's got a right hemisphere. That's the brain. The problem doesn't center in the brain. It centers in the mind. No one knows where the mind is. The mind is not subject to an x-ray. It's not subject to, you can operate on the brain. You can cut a hole in the scalp or through the brain and they do it with suction. They go to piano lessons, zip, right out like that. But to operate on the mind, they cannot operate on the mind because the mind is the medical equivalent of the soul. See? Spirit contra spiritus. The mind is the spirit. And this problem centers in the spirit. And what we have is a spiritual disease. And the only remedy for a spiritual disease is a spiritual awakening. And the only way I know to have a spiritual awakening is the result of these steps, which is a subject beyond what I've been asked to speak about. You and I are not what we see here. We all know that uh, this is not going to last. I have a number of medical problems, any one of which could kill me in a minute. And uh, I'll be 70 soon, and I expect to have things like that happen to me. So I know this it's held on all these years. But I have an opinion that this is not me. That there's something other than this. I don't know a thing about it, but I think there's something other than this. And it's something other than this that Alcoholics Anonymous has been treating for 32 years. It's been treating my spirit by giving a spiritual remedy. Spiritus contra spiritum. And I need that every day. I need Alcoholics Anonymous more today than ever I did. I think. Because it's still can be, it's still four o'clock in the morning sometimes. Yes? And sometimes that fear comes. Sometimes I say, what is that? Oh, yeah, you son of a bitch. You bastard fear. And I say, I offer myself to be, to do with me, to build with me, as you will. Fear goes away. Fear goes away. Well, this has been very nice. I'm one of those guys that goes around and, and uh, I talk a lot, as you know, on and on. And when I end, I usually end this way. And I'm going to end now. I don't think I can go any further. I'm going to stop crying. I read the last page in that book, which is something I read every day. It means a lot to me. Here it is. You may say, I will not have the benefit of contact with you who write this book. We cannot be sure. God will determine that. 
So you must remember that your real reliance is always upon him. He will show you how to create the fellowship you crave. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do for the new man who suffers. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously, obviously, you cannot transmit a message that you do not have. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and for countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and, and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. I usually end by talking of, of one of our pamphlets, which is uh, very dear to me, I think is our best pamphlet. And uh, it's called The Member's View of Alcoholics Anonymous. And on the very last page of that pamphlet, the author, he takes a biblical reference. And he recalls the time when John the Baptist was once again languishing in one of Herod's prisons. And John sent two of his friends to inquire of his cousin, Jesus, as to whether or not he was the Messiah. And these two men walked with the Lord, and, and they stopped him one day. And they said to him, Are you the Messiah? Are you the one we've been waiting for all such a long time, or shall we wait for somebody else? And he, he didn't answer that question. But he said to these two men, go back to John and tell John only what you have seen and only what you have heard. Tell John that the blind see and the lame walk and the deaf can hear. Tell John that the sick are made well and that the poor have the gospel brought to them. In my early training, I was told that the word poor in that context could mean poor in spirit. And everybody knows the word gospel simply means good news. So, my dear, dear sisters and brothers, in happy assembly here at Virginia Beach, if you will accept a report from me, I will tell you only what I have seen and only what I have heard. And based on that personal observation, it seems to me that the blind do see and the lame do walk. And I know I know that the deaf can hear, and most certainly, oh, most certainly, the sick are made well. And I have seen over and over and over again through the longest day and into the darkest night the good news of this program brought to the alcoholic who suffers the poor in spirit. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.